All right, guys, so let's go ahead and finish up the rest of this video, and let's go over the entire lifespan of the erythrocyte. So again, what do we say? We said that the erythrocyte usually only survives or has a lifespan of about 100 to 120 days, right? So why does it actually start wearing down after that amount of time? What is it about the red blood cell that's actually changing over time? Well, before we even go into that, we need to understand the normal cytoskeletal structure of a red blood cell so that we can des describe specifically what's happening and why this whole destruction pathway is occurring. All right? So let's come down here to the right corner and let's look at a, a red blood cell membrane. So if you look, you see this web protein right here that's inside of this, the, uh, the cell membrane? This is, if you don't remember any of the pro proteins, remember at least this one, please. This protein right here, this webbed pink and purple protein, this protein is called spectrin. Super, super important protein. So spectrin is gonna be this protein. Another protein, you see this orange protein right there? That orange protein that's binding the spectrin to the cell membrane, that orange protein right there, this orange protein is called anchorin. It's called anchorin, right? So it's anchoring the spectrin to the cell membrane, right? So again, we got spectrin, which is this web-like protein, and then we got the anchorin, which is anchoring the spectrin to the cell membrane. Why are these proteins so important? They're what allows for the red blood cell, because you know red blood cell is only about, on average, about 7 to 7.5 micrometers in diameter, right? It's about 2.5 micrometers in thickness. Well, what happens is it has to squeeze through capillaries that are sometimes smaller than he is, right? So he has to be able to bend and flex and be very, very pliable to squeeze through capillaries. So spectrin and anchorin are what allows for that process to occur. There is other proteins out here that I drew in blue. They, are they signi as significant? No, but they're good to know, I guess. I'll write them up here for you, a couple of them. You can have what's called um, glycophorin. Um, you can have what's called band three protein 4.1 and 4.2, all those buggers right there. Are they important? Not as necessarily important. The main ones that you really need to remember is spectrin and anchorin. But all of this cytoskeletal structure was what allows for that red blood cell to be pliable and allow for deformation and change its structure. But what happens is as these red blood cells get older, these proteins start becoming they start getting degraded, they start breaking down. And so what starts happening to the red blood cells membrane? Can it be flexible anymore? No, it starts getting rigid and tough and it won't, be, it won't allow for that deformation anymore. And then that's when we get destroyed because in, we have a spleen here, this purple organ, right? In the spleen, you have these capillaries. They're called sinusoidal capillaries. And if you remember anything about sinusoidal capillaries, if I look here, a sinusoidal capillary has huge, what's called intercellular clefts, really big intercellular clefts. So you have endothelial cells here, and then what happens is you have these really, really huge intercellular clefts. So when the red blood cell is actually circulating through this area, sometimes it can get stuck inside of these clefts. And then these macrophages, this macrophage that I have drawn right here, they come in and engulf it. Right, so this macrophage comes in and engulfs this guy. And so now this red blood cell has actually been phagocytosed by this macrophage. Now what happens? This is important now. So let's say here's this red blood cell. The red blood cell is in this macrophage. So let's say here is this red blood cell here. Right? It's inside of the macrophage. Then what happens? The macrophage starts releasing a ton of enzymes, all right? And it breaks down the main component of the red blood cell, which is hemoglobin, Hb, right? Hemoglobin. What does it do? It breaks down hemoglobin into the very critical components. One is going to be the heme component. The other one is going to be the globin. Now, you know hemoglobin... Um, it's made up of the heme and it has the globin. You know, in adult hemoglobin and hemoglobin A1, these globin chains, we actually denote these as two alpha and two beta chains. Um, fetal hemoglobin is two alpha and two gamma, and there is a very rare kind of hemoglobin, hemoglobin A2, which is two alpha and two delta, but this is the most common one. So what are these globin chains made up of? Amino acids. 
So look what can happen here. These guys can get degraded by proteases and enzymes get converted into amino acids. And guess what can happen to these amino acids? They can get recycled and go to help with this erythropoietic process again. So that's very important. So again, we got globin, which gets broken down into its constituents of amino acids, and that can get recycled. What about that heme? We already said the heme, we actually can pull out of it. Well, this is a good review. What can we pull out of this? We can pull iron out of it. And what can happen to that iron? It can bind onto apoferritin. Remember apoferritin? It can bind with apoferritin. And when apoferritin and iron bind, it forms what's called ferritin, which is just basically the holoenzyme form. So now look, we have ferritin here. And then what can happen to that ferritin? That ferritin can combine with other ferritin molecules, right? So here I'll have another ferritin. And then what can happen to that guy? He can combine with other ferritin molecules, and look what happens to this now. Look what happens here. If I combine all of these guys, now I can have a cluster of a lot of these ferritin molecules. Look at this. Ton of ferritin molecules together, and now we no longer call that ferritin, we call this hemosiderin. So that's a quick review, right? So again, what is this molecule here called? It's called ferritin. And then this molecule right here, which is just a cluster of them, is called hemosiderin. And again, what can happen to this iron also? You also know that it can get put into the blood and be bound to transferrin. That's a quick review, right? Now, what happens to this heme? The other part of it gets broken down into what most people commonly know as bilirubin, but that's eventually, right? So the first thing it actually gets broken down into is actually called biliverdin. So it actually gets broken down into what's called biliverdin. Then biliverdin gets broken down into what's called bilirubin. Now what happens? Look at this bilirubin here. We can't actually throw bilirubin into the bloodstream. Bilirubin, if it goes into the bloodstream, it's actually very toxic. It can actually get in, uh, you know, and it actually can cause neurotoxicity. So we don't want that. So we want to be able to bind bilirubin to something. So whenever it's pushed into the bloodstream out of this macrophage, it has to bind onto something. You know the liver makes a very beautiful plasma protein. A lot of it actually binds onto this guy. It does a lot of things. Look at this beautiful protein here. This beautiful protein here is called albumin. And look what can happen. The bilirubin can bind onto. I'm just going to draw bilirubin with a B now. So look at this. There's bilirubin. It's bound to albumin. Now, whenever the bilirubin is bound to the albumin, it can actually circulate in the blood now. But we call this type of bilirubin, I'm just going to write it here anyway, it's called unconjugated bilirubin. Okay, so this unconjugated bilirubin is the bilirubin that's bound in the plasma to albumin. What is this bilirubin used for? Well, this bilirubin, it comes here to the liver. The liver actually takes up the albumin, recycles the, uh, I'm sorry, it takes up the bilirubin through the albumin, and it can actually recycle the albumin. Then what happens to this bilirubin? The bilirubin gets into the liver, and the liver actually combines to bilirubin. It combines a very important protein here. And this protein, I'm sorry, not a protein, it's actually going to be like a sugar molecule. It's actually called glucuronic acid. So what happens? Glucuronic acid actually combines with bilirubin. And guess what this bilirubin is called? This bilirubin is called conjugated bilirubin, which is very soluble. So now I'm going to put in here C, B. What do we have? Conjugated bilirubin, which is just glucuronic acid combined with bilirubin. Then look where it's at. We put it into the gallbladder. You know the liver actually makes bile, right? But then it gets stored and concentrated in the gallbladder. And whenever the gallbladder contracts, it expels that bile. First off, what is bile? I just went right into it. What is bile? Bile is actually a component made by the liver that helps with fat digestion. Bile actually takes big fat dro like glob droplets, I'm sorry, big fat globules, and rips and shreds them apart into small fatty droplets. Well, guess who's one of the big com components of bile? Bilirubin. He's a very, very important component of bile. All right? So we have to conjugate him to make him soluble with glucuronic acid. And then now look, it's actually a component of the bile. And you know the bile duct? This is the common bile duct. It actually comes down here. We have the pancreas in orange here. The pancreas has what's called a main pancreatic duct. 
and the common bile duct and the main pancreatic duct actually fuse together and form what's called the hepatopancreatic ampulla, right? And look what it does. It pushes the bile out here into the duodenum where all the other stuff was. Look, we had the iron, we had the B12, we had the folate, all that stuff's out here too. But now what happens to that bilirubin, which is a component of the bile? Let's come down here. Now look at this. The bilirubin gets down here, right? You know there's a lot of bacteria within our flora. You know, I mean, there's a lot of bacteria flora within our gut, right? So there's a lot of bacteria that can be present within this area. So let's draw a bacteria here. Let's draw a cool little bacteria. So let's bring this down here. And look, we have a bacteria here. Look at him. He's smiling because he's going to help this process. Now, what happens with this bacteria? This bacteria, it releases certain types of enzymes, like bacterial proteases. And what does it do? It breaks down bilirubin into a different form, which now we call, get ready for this sucker, urobilinogen. That's a heck of a name, right? So urobilinogen. So again, what happens? Bilirubin combines with glucuronic acid, gets put into the bile, what's one of the major components of the bile, comes down through the common bile duct, fuses with the main pancreatic duct, forms the hepatopancreatic ampulla, it gets pushed out into the duodenum, which is the first foot of the small intestine. Now it's a component of the bile. It goes all the way down to usually the large intestine, which is where you're going to have, it can be in the small intestine or the large intestine, where you have your bacteria flora. And this bacteria flora releases proteases that breaks down the bilirubin into what's called urobilinogen. So now look at this urobilinogen. The urobilinogen, some of it, a small portion of it, about 10% of it, can actually get absorbed. It can get reabsorbed back into the, the bloodstream. So it can actually get reabsorbed back into the bloodstream here. And then it can, some of it can actually go to the kidney. And when it goes to the kidney, some of it can go to the kidney, and when it goes to the kidney, it actually is what's causing the yellow color in your urine. Well, that's what causes it. It's because of the urobilin. What ha it's urobilinogen when it gets into the bloodstream, but when it's excreted out through the kidneys in the urine, it's called urobilin. We'll talk about that in a second. But some of the urobilinogen can actually get recycled. It can go back in that process there. So it can go back into the glucuronic. It can go back and conjugate with the glucuronic acid and just come back and keep getting recycled, okay? Through what's called the enterohepatic circulation. Now, some of the urobilinogen will actually continue to get broken down in the, in the actual, the intestines, right? And when it gets broken down, it gets broken down into another chemical, which we actually call sterco Billin. And this is what makes your doo-doo brown, all right? So stercobilin is what causes that pigment within your poo-poo to make it brown, right? So this is what causes that brown pigmentation within the doo-doo, all right? So well, how the heck did I get from urobilinogen to stercobilin? Well, you know another name for urobilinogen is actually fecal stercobilinogen, okay? So urobilinogen actually has another name. We can actually, in the, in, in the GI tract, though, it's called fecal stercobilinogen, all right? So urobilinogen, if it's in the intestines, it's called fecal stercobilinogen. And whenever it continues to get broken down, it produces stercobilin, which produces the brown pigmentation in the feces. Why the heck would I mention this brown pigmentation in the feces? Um, you know, if someone actually has a... Uh, a gallstone, maybe there's some type of obstruction within the uh, common bile duct or the hepatic ducts or something like that, right? Or it's actually, let's say it's blocking the hepatopancreatic ampulla and you can't secrete out that bile. If you can't secrete the bile, will you have this uh, urobilinogen or stercobilin within the feces? No. And would the color of your feces be brown? No. So this is a good clinical indicator of some type of obstruction within this biliary or pancreatic pathway where you're not actually pushing the bilirubin out. So that's really, really important. Another thing about this is if there does happen to be a gallstone blocking this common bile duct, what can happen? Well, this, this, this bilirubin can get pushed into the bloodstream. And when bilirubin is actually pushed into the bloodstream, Within this conjugated form, it can actually go and it actually can deposit into different tissues. One of them is the sclera, and what does it cause? It causes like a yellowish coloring of the actual the sclera, or maybe even some of the palms of the hand or other parts of the body, and that's called jaundice. 
So you're probably wondering why I'm mentioning it. It's for that, so we can have some clinical indicators of that, okay? So now, we have literally gone over all the destruction pathway of an erythrocyte. So again, let's just real quick run through a quick recap. Why does this happen again? Because of the breakdown within spectrin and enchiron within the red blood cell. Or due to the breakdown of glycophorins, band 3, protein 4.1, protein 4.2. Are they important? Yes, but not as important as these two. When these guys start actually wearing down or getting broken down, the red blood cell can't be as flexible, it can't be as pliable, and it gets stuck inside of the sinusoidal capillaries, which are in three places, liver, spleen, bone marrow. When it gets stuck inside of the spleen, which is the most common one, the macrophages will uh, phagocytose them and break it down, and it'll break down hemoglobin into globin, which gets digested into amino acids, which can get recycled for erythropoiesis, and heme, which gets broken down into iron, and that iron, what happens to him, he actually can bind onto apoferritin to give you ferritin, and then the ferritin can combine and give you hemosiderin, or some of the iron can actually get pushed out through ferroportin, which is very important, right? And they can actually get used for other processes. And then the other part of the heme, the protoporphyrin, actually gets broken down to biliverdin and bilirubin and pushed into the bloodstream, which can be bound to albumin, which is made by the liver, and that's unconjugated bilirubin. Then that bilirubin can actually get taken up by the liver, rip the albumin off and recycle it, combine it with glucuronic acid to give you conjugated bilirubin, which is a very, very important component of bile, gets taken down through the common bile duct, main pancreatic duct, hepatopancreatic ampulla, pushes it out into the duodenum, and then what happens? It can actually undergo breakdown by some of these bacterial flora, and then the bacterial flora will break down the bilirubin into urobilinogen, or also called fecosterchobilinogen. And that urobilinogen, some of it can actually get reabsorbed through the enterohepatic circulation and get reused, or it can actually come out in the urine, as, which causes the yellow color of the urine, which is urobilin. And then the last thing is, if the urobilinogen continues to get degraded and broken down, it's what causes the brown color within your poo, all right? And that's called stercobilin. And again, why is that important? Because if you don't have that color, you might know that there's something going on within that biliary duct system, right? Maybe a gallstone. And if there's a gallstone, depending on upon where it be, it, it may be, it can actually cause backflow of the bilirubin into the bloodstream. It can cause jaundice, the yellowing color of the skin or the, uh, the sclera, right? All right, guys, we basically went over all the erythropoietic process and the lifespan of an erythrocyte. I hope it helped, guys. All right, see you, engineers.